Yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome again to another session uh, for our Meet Your Uni events. We are in our second event this summer semester. And uh, we are have ahead uh, four great speakers who will do three great presentations. And um, first, let me introduce what Meteor Uni is, which is um, simply an, I would say, an informal arrange in order to uh, put together the different uh, people from professors, uh, meet about researchers uh, and students uh, that conform and compose our uh, school and to put them in conversation and around topics that uh, somehow uh, this semester uh, Florina and myself uh, kind of try to curate. And the idea is not so much to foreground the institute profiles, but more the individuals' uh, motivations and uh, personal works or researchers, uh, researches that are uh, behind each of these uh, voices. Um, so this is thanks, uh, or this initiative is coming from the uh, uh, ERC group, which is the, the group conformed by mainly PhD researchers and, and researchers themselves. Um, so that's being said, uh, let me introduce today the, our four um, speakers that again will do three presentations. Uh, and I will simply introduce them in the, in the order that we have in the poster. You can see that behind me. So first we have uh, Celia Di Paoli. Um, Celia studied architecture in Innsbruck and Berlin, and she lives and works also in Innsbruck, where she is associate professor at Studio One. And in her work, she deals, among other things, with the interaction of image and design space, as well as with architecture as a means of communication and mediation. And her work has been exhibited in different institutions in places uh, all around the world, like Berlin, New York, Denver, or Stuttgart. And some of her primary projects are the museum store in the Jewish Museum in Berlin, or the exhibition and publication, The Colors of Berlin, uh, done together with the staff uh, blind. Uh, she also has uh, ongoing exhibitions running right now at the uh, Falkons Museum in Innsbruck, the Vorarlberg Museum in Bregenz, as well as the Humboldt Forum in Berlin. And last year, uh, the project for a memorial site opened at the uh, Landes Krankenhauses Hall. Um, then we have uh, our second um, group, which is the Practice Merced and Lead, who is composed by uh, Lida Vada Fared and Merced Atasi. I hope you uh, approve my uh, pronunciation, Lida, if not correct me. Uh, who founded, as I said, uh, uh, their practice, Mercer and Lead, uh, three years ago, 2017. Lead studied at the Stadel Schule in Frankfurt, where he graduated uh, winning the, and receiving the AAY Master Thesis Award. And Mercer also graduated fr in Frankfurt, and he also studied his uh, bachelor in Florence. Uh, both are teaching and doing PhD at the Institute of Urban Design in our, in our uh, faculty. And in their practice in recent years, they have been involved in different projects and, uh, and researches, as well as they exhibited at the Palais de Tokyo in Paris, the Grazer uh, Kunstverein, and two years ago in the Seoul Biennale of Architecture and, and Urbanism. And we have, uh, last but not least, um, Sophie Wolf, who she studied uh, art and history in Dresden, Milan, and Pisa. And she was research assistant at the Unit of History of Architecture and Preservation of Monuments, again, also in our faculty. And since uh, 2018, uh, so he's part of the research project on the facet architecture in the border and reuse of South Tyrol and Trentino after uh, World War uh, I. So in her dis uh, dis uh, dissertations, uh, she focused on the communicative potentials of drawing in the Quattrocento architectural publications. And she participated in numerous international conferences and workshops all over Europe and has published internationally in various, on various topics. Just to mention one, um, uh, had, uh, one of her last articles last year uh, in Opus uh, Insertum 
title Francesco Di Giorgio on mechanics. Um, so protocol has been done, presentation has been done. Um, I think we can just simply start with the presentation in in the order that, that we present and afterwards uh, Florina will uh, conduct um, the moderation. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you for uh, inviting me to give this lecture. And as we just have 20 minutes, let me hop right into the subject. And just in the beginning, I want to mention that a lot of people from the school participated in the projects. I saw Stefan Meyer, he's now working at Studio 3, is online. Uh, or, for example, Schottil Natke and Eric from Institut für Gestaltung. So, I considering everybody, I just uh, want to thank uh, the participants to the projects. Um, the title is Images of Spaces Imagined Realities. Uh, architecture and image have forever shared an intimate connection. Let us just have a glimpse in our own way of working, a phase of imagination has always preceded the production of architecture, be it as uh, drawing diagrams, plans or perspective, abstract or not. Architecture has always been thought in terms of and communicated by means of images. When I observe the work being produced at different uh, faculties, architectural faculty, I increasingly encounter projects that consciously or unconsciously seem to preoccupied to be preoccupied with their visual impact. I sometimes even have the feeling of an architecture moving towards the mere production of existing images foregrounding its visual aesthetization. But let me talk about a different approach to the notion of the image in an architectural discourse. I think we can agree on the sentence, an image is a visual representation of something, but can it be more? I say yes. So what I'd rather talk about is a mental Ill image that exists in an individual's mind as something one remembers or rem imagines. The subject of an image doesn't need to be real. It may be an abstract concept. Slavoj Cicek and Jan Berger have pointed out the possibility of working with these mental images or even manipulating them for ideological or commercial purposes. Images perpetuated in public education, media as well as popular culture and also in architecture have a profound impact on the formation of such mental images. They say, what makes them so powerful is that they circumvent the faculty of the conscious mind, but instead directly targets the subconscious and so on. So far, so good. Uh, let me show you a couple of examples uh, out of our work as scenographer and exhibition designer. And let me talk in what way staged spaces and in installation and places of remembrance can turn into images of our world and open up the possibility for a broader understanding of the world around us. Let me start with two small exhibition projects that in fact rely on the image as means of transportation of a message to evoke a certain reaction among the visitors. The Colors of Berlin was a project we exhibited in 2005 in Berlin, Stuttgart, Denver, New York, and other places. It had the subtitle, Berlin is often viewed blindly. Books, films, and other narratives like to present a glittering picture of the future. Around the years 2000, they still dominated the urban imaginary worlds of Berlin. What has been lost is the personal, the peripheral, the ordinary, the diversity of the city's everyday life. Berlin, Berlin seems blind to his humanity. The colors of Berlin makes visible 
the places that disappear in urban perception. So, through the exhibition and the color fan, the diversity and colorfulness of Berlin's white spots were made visible. It was and is a different kind of city guide giving the flaneur a visual aid to experience everyday life in a new way while roaming the city. The color combinations opened up a different approach of evaluating these urban sites by offering a maximum abstraction level, reducing them to a composition of two colors extracted from images taken. The visitor of the exhibition and the people using the color fan like that are seduced to look closely to find the colors in reality and probably use them to paint their own walls using some of these combinations. They lead the people to the stories connected to the overseen urban sites of Berlin. The second project was called Spaces of uh, the Offshore World, Tax Havens and Offshore Centers in Europe. But what is the image? Uh, many of us connect to this uh, title. Yes, uh, in the context of offshore, various spatial metaphors and images are used. The word offshore alludes to an island. The connotation of the free sea is all the way to by the term tax haven, which in German becomes tax oasis, in French a paradise, paradis fiscal, or in contrast to the unfort fiscal, the tax hell. The legal loophole used for tax avoidance is also described with a spatial image, the tax loophole in English, and la niche fiscal in French. Again and again, pictures of sunny, sandy beaches, palm trees, the sea deck chairs and parasols are shown on websites dealing with dry tax optimization. They also evoke the image of an island that is difficult to reach. The offshore rhetoric conveys not only images, but a narrative. The new offshore world is a safe haven to which people flee from the bureaucracy of the outdated nation state for free and clever offshore individuals, borders are lifted. This is where the exhibition of tax havens and offshore centers in Europe comes in. On the one hand, we are pursuing the goal of working through the ignored topic, which is considered to dry in such a way that it brought closer to a broad public. Through the pictures, the discussions are to make concrete. The abstract is given an image. A particularly important goal of the exhibition and the book is to counter the rhetoric of the tax evasion industry with images of real places. This should make it clear how far apart the common rhetoric and reality are from each other. In the concept of this exhibition, the figure ground understanding of pictorial communication forms the corresponding basic structure. Only the text and the rhetoric transported with it were also given a spatial role. Understandable at a glance, the rhetoric and visual language of the banks and the offshore worlds were confronted with photos and images from the rea reality of the text havens, which attempted to correct the public perception of this topic with strikingly placed facts and figures like a political advertisement. A different approach was taken in the traveling exhibition, I will no longer be taken for a fool. Ich lasse mich nicht länger für einen Narren halten. Which was part of the EU founded Interact 4 project, Psychiatrische Landschaften, dealing with the history of psychiatric institutions in North Tyrol, South Tyrol, and the Trentino. I will no longer be taken for a fool, scolds the hunting assistant, Joseph B. in 1903 about his treatment and confinement in the psychiatric ward. 
the history of psychiatric patients in the two Tyrolean asylums in Hall and Perchina in South Tyrol, as well as in Innsbruck Clinic, has hardly been noticed so far. This exhibition focused on them. However, their fates are not exhibited to satisfy curiosity about the outlandish, proceeded into carefully researched, anonymized uh, case history, they are rather read out in books from board to board. This time, this takes time and attention. Assess, work, eat, treat, custody, kill, educate, deport. The biographical case histories are assigned verbs that characterize essential aspects of the narrative. It would be easy to tell most of the stories about keeping and sending. It's a history of shame and stigmatization that continues into the present. The chosen format of the traveling exhibition was a good way to reach many people in different places, but it posed, poses a particular challenge. From a scenographer's point of view, the exhibition should be able to integrate itself into the given spaces and at the same time assert itself in given space places or in other words from its own space in space in which visitors can engage with the exhibition. In this way a place was created in each case which even in non-places extends the invitation to engage with such a difficult subject. General conceptualist cliches of the psychiatric sanatoriums, the furniture that was necessary for the daily routine in the hospitals, the coercive situation of the patients, and not least the color white were starting points for the formal design of the exhibition furniture. At the same time, an abstraction of these cliches in the sense of a reduction to the essential codes in this project was indispensable. It had to be hanged. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. yes, okay. It had to be possible to read and understand the formal language of the exhibition furniture at first glance without assuming any, any specialist knowledge. After all, the concept should work for school classes as well as for relatives and professional trained staff. In addition, they still were meant to be used, but not to be comfort comfortable, because this would contradict the reality of the patients and the imagined experience of the exhibition. Therefore, the furniture was designed in a way that was a bit too narrow, too high, too low, etc., cetera, to, to feel comfortable. Visitors were forced to arrange themselves with uh, the given situations. Like this, visitors should put themselves in the role of treating staff and patients. The following up project of this exhibition was handed over the public in last October. We were commissioned to design a memorial and place of remembrance for the 360 patients who were deported and murdered during National Socialist era in the years 1940 to 42 either directly via HAL and uh, nursing homes. Such places of memory must also be understood as political places. Their focus is less on imparting knowledge than on current process of negotiating the meaning of the past and the artistic spatial intervention. The question of the participation of all social groups arises only from the subject matter and the fact that the memorial site is located in the grounds of the largest psychiatric institution in Tyrol, and accordingly the most diverse needs and life situation had to be addressed. Experiencing, searching and finding are the basic ideas behind the design of 360 steels, each of which represents the lost home and the emptiness left behind by each individual person who was killed in the course of Nazi euthanasia. A map of Tyrol and the neighboring regions is laid over the entire memorial site so that each of the memorial steels 
could be geographically placed at the hometown of the respective victim. In this way, the whole memory site results in a map of emptiness that these people have left behind in the history of all these places. Thank you, Stefan Meyer, for participating in this project. With the next project, I want to show that making exhibitions no longer consists of merely assembling, researching, and presenting historically striking, aesthetically accepted, and hopefully interesting artifacts while leaving the hermeneutic process entirely of the artifacts' erratic emanations, as Frank Den Austen puts in his book Space Time Narrative. Alles fremd, alles Tirol. The view of the foreign and European thinking is mostly a negative one, determined by the effort of the build to build up borders to ward off and devalue the other. The exhibition Alles Fremd, Alles Tirol deals with the image of oneself and of others in Tirol. Referring to the cultural technique of stereotypes, the scenography takes up the motive of classifying and categorizing. Draw it that open either on one side or the other, cupboards, flaps, and boxes allow visitors to immerse themselves physically in the theme. The idea for the visitors was to take their own prejudice and stereotypical images out of the box or out of the drawer, the cupboard, and compare them with the story told and interactive installations placed in the exhibition. In the end, people were asked to comment on the reviewed understanding and perception of the cliché of what is typical Tyrolean. Coming to an end, I briefly show you the two most recent exhibition projects we did in 2020, which both have a focus on families and children as visitors. Weltstadt oder so. Brigantium in the first century at the Vorarlberg Museum in Bregenz. On the first level, the exhibition focuses on urban life in a provincial city belonging to the Roman Empire. On a second level, we question tasks, ideas, and definitions of the city in general. And on meta level, it is again about the coexistence of people who come from different cultures, backgrounds, and this is also visible from the finds. The exhibition design all works around different scales and perspectives and playful experience that follows Marshall McLuhan's famous quote, we, we experience far more than we understand. So it is experience far more than understanding that influence our behavior. Children in particular have to be treated differently when it comes to exhibition design. Their boxes of knowledge, stereotypes, prejudice have not been filled yet. Furthermore, they don't come to exhibitions to learn things in the first place. They just want to have fun, have a playful time, experience and discover new things. This is how they learn. Joyful moments are the career way for the content of the exhibition. This in mind, we were commissioned to design children exhibition, the children exhibition at the new Humboldt Forum in Berlin with the title Nimplatz, Take a Seat. The exhibition invites visitors, especially children, to recognize the interconnections in the world, to discover what is foreign and what is their own and what is foreign in a house for all that brings together different cultures and perspective promotes the international exchange uh, of ideas, launches current topics such as migration, religion, and globalization, and creates spaces to encounter and exchange. With these goals of the Humboldt Forum in mind and understanding them as a mission, we want to understand the first exhibition for children as an invitation to a newly opened house for all. Nimplatz, is a, an integrative gesture of welcome, giving space, granting space, locating somebody, one socially and familiar, circles or new situations. The thematic 
clusters are orientated towards aspects of taking place. Individual and social positioning in society is told along micro histor histories like who has a place here, join us a place to sit still or chill. But the major expressions for the kids are the different possibilities to play, to climb, to run, uh, to listen, to discover, to draw, build, paint, and chill. We still wait for the museum to open for the visit uh, due Corona. Um, yes. Uh, and thank you once again to Stefan Meyer and Shotil Natke and also to Eric. Exhibiting means telling stories in space. Exhibit Exhibitions are consciously designed spaces of experience that have not only a mental, but also a physical effect and therefore directly transport attitudes and contents as well as trigger motivations. Space creates sensitivities. The design of space, is therefore the conscious creation of sensitivities. Architecture has a great influence on our sensibilities and it is often a subtle in invoking physical experiences, for example. In exhibitions, the staging, the design of spaces often determines the view, the perspective, the way we look at objects. Neuroscience assumes that the human experience of space is an essential building block for the development of the human brain. In child development, psychology, spatial experience, and movement are even decisive for mental development leaps. Little people have a fine sensorium for spaces. Good architecture therefore express itself through inclusion, but through subtlety, metaphor and ex uh, abstraction and through a physical operational field of sheer scenographic possibility as well. Thank you for listening. Uh, hi, hi everyone. Uh, thank you, Celia, for your. Uh, uh, for the for your presentation and thanks uh, Gonzalo for the introduction and also for having us here we are super happy to uh, to be here and talk with colleagues and friends so today through this presentation we are going to talk about um, um, to talk about image in architecture the way we see it and also the way uh, we implemented through some of our projects, uh, at, uh, like in our design practice, Mayor Shanley. Uh, so let's get us started. Uh, most of the time we see, understand, uh, recognize, identify, or even describe everything through their visual expressions. Uh, and these visual expressions initially received by our eyes, uh, of course, and enable us to erase them, depict them, interpret them. And most of the time also, we are using them unconsciously. So like, let's say uh, we have been always involved with images. And now talking about architecture, uh, we can say from the beginning, we were kind of trying to imitate or get inspiration from our surroundings. And also we were trying to kind of transform those imitation and memory, whatever, into their most abstract forms. So, but like, if I want to elaborate, uh, elaborate it, uh, I can do it like through this image. Uh, here we see an image of a tree. Uh, if we want to describe it, we can say it has two parts, a leg and its crown in which one is holding the other, of course. And the crown is marking the ground uh, and defines the territory by casting a shadow. As we see in the right picture above, uh, these characteristics used by us like back in the days 
uh, to create a shelter. So we see the trunk of tree turned into a column uh, to hold the crown. And then in the third image, it's a schema uh, turned the shelter into a primitive hut. And finally, in the last image, we see an archetypal form, which now we call it a single family house or it's kind of a vernacular building. Uh, so in this description, uh, we see a process of reduction or even we can say abstraction. But from the way we see it, it's all about the qualities that one can explore in the tree. So the image has been there in architecture since the beginning, and we became curious and interested in finding out how it has been seen and used in architecture, which is different from the way that we already know it. It's best to start talking about Le Corbusier, as he suggests a conscious use of images in his works. This is very interesting for us because Le Corbusier's imagery world was broad and ambiguous. It includes historical references, everyday objects, and also his way of interpretations of them in his painting. Here is a painting by him called Diurnal Rhythms of the Sun and the Sea that he used later on in his projects. As we see here in the Carpenter Center, for example, he used the bipolar characteristic of the image in the configuration of the building. As we see in the plan on the right side, two curvy linear figures twinned in opposition. So we can say there is somehow a likeness between this plan and the picture on the left, let's say the painting. So we again found the use of image in Le Corbusier Pavilion. Actually, he used the same characteristics in the spatial organization of the plan. Through this transformation, the rectangular form of the pavilion displaced from its center, and the center emphasized by becoming the corridor space. Not only in the plan, if you look at the picture on the left, also in the elevation, he used the visual expression, but this time in the process of form making for the roof of the pavilion. Uh, actually, then we found that many other projects uh, sharing the same characteristics of the diurnal uh, rhythms of the sun and the sea, but uh, not this time in Le Corbusier's, in Le Corbusier's work, actually in John Hayduk's project. Uh, we realized John Hayduk had borrowed the same image, uh, like the exact same image, but he interpreted it as a Siamese a snake. He aimed kind of to explore other qualities or even the different ways of using them in his works. Uh, but I'm super sure that now you're referring to the previous uh, slide. Uh, yes, in the previous slide, they are having the similar kind of characteristics, uh, you know, with Le Corbusier's work. Even though in the beginning, it looks like he was in imitating a corpse way of using images, but later on, some of his projects actually catch our eyes. Uh, for example, Farm Library is one of those projects. Uh, in his sketches, he's obviously suggesting using a Siamese snake, as you see it in the picture here. Uh, but the thing is that we cannot recognize this easily by looking at the final project. Uh, this object doesn't have the same way of using uh, the image, uh, you know, as he was suggesting in the, the other uh, and using in the other project. He created a library here, like no ordinary library. The library that used to be uh, accessible and also for readers and has a communal space for the books uh, became a panoptican like building. And the librarian is the one and only visitor who's controlling everything. Then we came to thinking that for Hayduk, at some point, creating a novel form was not anymore a concern. And discovering actually unprecedented qualities become, became like more important. And I think now it is exactly um, where we can start talking about our projects in which we are questioning uh, these kind of potentials in understanding and using images. Uh, so when we started working on images, uh, it kind of also brings the necessity to study and understand architectural representation. Uh, this. Uh, I think it's sure we have to move. No, no. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, it also brings the necessity to study and understand representation. 
Uh, this is one of our projects, Misfit Qualities, where we tried uh, to depict or exaggerate the conflict between the qualities of the real and its representation. So in this project, we specifically studied and worked with the drawing of the Wallhouse 2 by John Haydrich. This drawing was interesting for us in a way he used representational qualities to imply the means of the project. And if you want to describe the drawing, we can say this is an oblique projection in which he represents plan and elevation of the parts of the building with different colors. But also the difference between the chromatic intensity of each color represent the plan and elevation of that specific part. So basically, through colors, chroma, and saturation, he introduced the object, its parts, and a possible way of reading the real. So after reading this image, we became we came to thinking, what if we manipulate the drawing through representational qualities to destabilize our understanding from the drawing and the final object? So as you see here, we simply have studied um, colors, cast shades, uh, shadows, no shadows, reflection, figuration, transparency, and etc. And in the end, we adapt our findings to one another to create one possible final object from our studies. As you see in the picture, the final object is frontal. Also, the separation between each part of the object, which was obvious in the original drawing, now can be read differently. And consequently, the parts of the drawing also can assemble each time differently, and also we photograph some of them. And uh, we would like to show some of them, some of this compositional reading and misreading in next pages. Okay, now moving forward, we understood the Wallhouse drawing is suggesting a three-dimensionality by combining plan and elevation. Uh, so now kind of we can say there is another dimension he, hidden in every two-dimensional form, or let's say a suggestion for another existence. Uh, but uh, to reveal another possibility of existence, we need to explore its spatial qualities related to order transparency, depth, uh, relationship, and the other things. Uh, so Eliseski also suggests the same thing uh, in this image, showing what happens if we put a line or a rectangular surface in the state of movement. Uh, so as we can see, the first one transformed from a one-dimensional entity to a two-dimensional circular surface. And the second one transformed from a two-dimensional entity to a cylindrical form. Uh, which is, of course, a three-dimensional object. So basically, uh, by adding movement to an unanimated image, he suggests the possibility of transforming it to another dimension. Also, with this exploration, he depicts a drawing as a container that can contain existing as well as non-existing things. So this is a uh, painting by him, and uh, uh, of course by that I mean Elisiski from uh, his Prown series, that's Prown number 30. Uh, as you can see, you kind of also understood that this painting is completely flat, and uh, but the superimposition of the shape suggests depth and also puts an ambiguity in the spatial relations between uh, the forms inside of the painting. It almost looks like an ex uh, looks like an, a screenshot from a video animation, and that's why somehow we feel like to turn the painting and see what is happening behind. So our quest was uh, very simple: to put this image in the state of movement, uh, to explore its spatial geometrical uh, representational qualities, and examine the potentials of another medium. And here is a video animation on our understanding of objects in general. Uh, so this, uh, uh, this is one of the experiments. And uh, as you can see, the painting moves continually frontal from one side to the other. And as a result, uh, you can see the compositional relations between shapes are changing. But I can say the shapes are also themselves, they are changing. Uh, and in this manner, we can never grasp the object entirely. 
So basically, in these experiments, uh, what became essential for us was the geometrical relationship of the forms and their compositional arrangement after a full rotation. And of course, here again, the same uh, uh, image or like a painting duplicated three times uh, because actually we wanted to see, like we wanted to experiment on the same painting and to see uh, like to get deeper to understand the possibilities that video animation may impose in the understanding of qualities of an object. So now getting deeper in this exploration, here we see some drawings by Niseron where he also suggests the possible three-dimensional objects, but this time through the combination of the plan and elevation. So we can assume the movement suggested by Leszczewski in his drawing, the one that we saw it before uh, on the previous slides, are like the projection rays in here, moving through three directions to intersect and crystallize in a three-dimensional form. Uh, talking about the endless possibility of the combination between an elevation, we came across of these buildings by Robert Venturi and Dennis Scott Brown. And as you see in this picture, there are two buildings which are alike, but not identical. We in immediately recognize them as a single family house because they have, uh, because uh, they have same images somehow. But the image has been slightly changed by different articulation in its three dimensional Form. So we became interested in this to explore how we can make the image of the single family house to become familiar object, but at the same time, not identical to its origin. Hmm. And here you see, uh, you can see our attempt to distract the familiarity. Now we will move forward to talk about two buildings. Uh, in this project, actually, we commissioned to propose a new interior, which is supposed to be the showcase of new publications and the bookshop itself. Uh, so the shop is located uh, on the um, uh, ground floor of a four story building with a yard in its front. And actually, it's supposed to attract the curiosity of the stroller, uh, strollers who were passing by the just on the street. So we arranged a spatial organization of the project through the combination of different uh, figural uh, architecture elements. As you can see in the plan, the center of the space is distracted by the twin semicircles, which are dislocated in opposition. There are also two corridors in the space connecting the building's interior with its exterior, uh, one through a door and the other one through a window. Uh, and as um, I said uh, in the previous slide, we work with some architectural elements, which are walls, corridor space, windows, handrails, and ramp. And we studied the combination of bipolar characteristics with their qualities. Um, if I want to like uh, describe it or uh, give an example is that a wall demarcates a circle and become a circular room. This circular room, which is homogeneous, central and panopticon adapt the bipolar characteristic of, to itself and its centrality uh, twinned in opposition. So the room is not homogeneous anymore, but it is continuous. It is neither one room or nor two rooms. And basically we need to find a new vocabulary to define it. And as you see, the interior of the shop got separated from the outside, but the continuity of the form of the facade and the slope suggests an integration between the interior and the exterior. And 
And as you see also, we can say the figuration of the interior space was cut out from the initial facade of the building, which is now in contrast with the plan of facade of the whole building. And although the sequential space of the interior, as you see, is disconnected by walls, but they are integrated and intertwined through colors, overlapping figures, textures, doors, windows, and they all together create a misreading, or let's say a new reading to the special organization of the interior. Like uh, you can also see some interior images that we decided to render in the still life mode, uh, frontal and objective. And some more renders that we can see here. Uh, finally, the last project is a villa which is located in the northern uh, mountains of Tehran in Iran. Uh, this villa is supposed to be a weekend getaway uh, and it's just started actually to get built. Uh, so let's describe it. Uh, this building consists of a plinth, a corridor space, a wall, a chimney, and uh, three single family houses. They align on a diagonal axis, which is marked by the wall on the ground. And this creates a conflict between the frontality of the land and also the building's diagonal juxtaposition. Uh, the plinth became a part through adapting the characteristic of the topography. Two voided space has been cut out from it. One of them functions as a car park and the other one as a swimming pool. It also contains the housekeeper, flat, and the mechanical room. So we can say this plinth is, uh, it's not only defined the relationship uh, of the ground with the, uh, with the building, but also it works as a container for it. Uh, the wall demarcates the space and defines a series of related antagonism, such as inside and outside, uh, close and open, mass and void, in between and beside, and uh, behind and front. And apart from defining the space, uh, as you can see, the wall embeds, hide, separate, reveal the other parts of the building. Uh, as I said before, uh, there are three single family houses, as the building implies, but they function as one. From the front, they look elevated from the ground, but actually in the back, they are all, all of them directly meeting the ground and have equal access to the backyard and also the swimming pool in front of them. As we see in the plan, the house is defined behind the wall and between two voided figures. And um, as you see, uh, the three single family houses, they are merged together as one building, but three different characteristics attributed to each of them. One is a guest house, you see it in the bottom, the middle one is a living house, and on the top, we are looking at a sleeping house. And here we want to show how the interior space is also articulated within the image of the single family house. And in the end, we also adapted the texture of the building to frontality as one of the representational characteristics. And as you see here, the proportional characteristic of the brick-like texture transform and distorted by adapting itself to the geometry of the object. Yeah, that was the last slide. Thank you so much, everyone, Thank you so much. for listening. Uh, sorry for interrupting, yeah. you're unmuted, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, so can you see my presentation? Yes, we do. Okay, so thank you very much for inviting me or, and for having me and for the nice um, uh, introduction. So um, <clears throat> actually, I, I think it's kind of interesting that we started with something that might seem um, more like an like a spatial image or like something that an image that uh, is a three dimensional in, in some ways. 
and then came to uh, the representation of architectural pro project. And uh, now I'm coming back to uh, what might be called the, um, the roots of architectural images, um, which were also cited or mentioned um, uh, before, that is to um, the 15th century and therefore so to the beginnings of um, the writing about architecture and thus uh, representing theory of architecture in images, um, because as many of, of you might know, uh, Vitruvius in fact um, did not um, uh, come to us with images. And so the 15th century was uh, in effect, the moment in which uh, theory became um, a theory and image. Um, I should maybe warn you that uh, I won't show images or not, not that much images of architecture, but images uh, which were used by one particular architect uh, to um, transmit his knowledge and his teaching about architecture. And this particular architect is uh, Francesco Di Giorgio. And he worked in the 15th century from uh, 1460 to 1490, approximately in Italy, that is mainly in Siena, Urbino and um, Naples also. So why uh, am I showing you this uh, first image, which might seem much, um, much more illustrative or like um, narrative, decorative, um, it's interesting because it's one of the uh, rare images um, which are not technical, one could say, in the treatises of Francesco di Giorgio. And um, there are two of the treatises. Um, just to give you a really, really short introduction, um, the first one was written in the 1470s, 1480s, and this second one was uh, written in the 1490s. So there is like a, an evolution one can, can see in the treatise. And therefore I also choose in my doctoral thesis to uh, call the first one handbook, which different, which is meant to, to um, like put a difference between, between the first and the second. Uh, writing and the second one, the later one, I um, I continued to call treatise. Um, just uh, to recall, uh, maybe I, I should mention again that uh, I'm not an architect, but I'm like more an art historian studying architecture. So maybe that uh, will explain my really kind of a bit different approach uh, to drawings of architecture. So, um, now, what is shown here in this image is um, an illustration or a figure, figure um, explaining somehow an episode Francesco di Giorgio takes from Vitruvius, so from the really uh, like the authority uh, for the architects of the 15th and 16th century, and which refers to a narrative episode in which uh, Dinocrates. Um, presents himself to Alexander the Great, and he proposes a really magnificent project uh, that is to transform or to shape uh, Mount Athos in the shape of uh, a statue of Alexander the Great himself, holding in one hand a city, as you maybe can see, and in the other hand, um, like a basin, which would uh, collect all the waters of the mountain. And it's interesting because Francesco puts it at the beginning of his treatise um, to somehow show what he expected from an architect, that is to be able to present himself um, to the, the highest in rank, let's say, to the nobleman and to royalty and to um, present oneself in a way that would lead maybe to an, um, to an, yeah, to, to, to be in, engaged or to be paid for projects. 
And in effect, uh, in this narration, Dinocrates ends up being the uh, main architect of Alexander the Great. So it's really an episode which, um, like in the in the beginning, uh, directly uh, communicates to the reader what uh, Francesco di Giorgio wants with his treatise, what is his aim. Um, I will show you some images which um, may show how Francesco di Giorgio uses the images uh, in, in the handbook and in the treatise. And um, I will start chronologically. So I will present the uh, older drawings first. Okay. So here is what uh, might be the most um, uh, typical idea of a ground plan or of a plan of architecture. And um, in my thesis, I normally, <laughs> I started studying or being interested in the images of the treatise because and of the handbook, um, because uh, they were so there were so many of them and they were so present on the pages. That is why I chose to present you always the, the whole page and then some details I will maybe dis discuss a little bit a little bit in detail. So as you see. On the page, there's nearly as much text as there are images. And um, normally Francesco describes um, many case studies or many examples of uh, ground plans in this case. And uh, then he shows them also in the drawings. And uh, just to explain why I will show different types of images of architecture and also of um, uh, mechanics and and other things and that uh, we can see in these images how Francesco or how the how the architect tried to um, develop or to, to yes to develop the, the best type of image the best um, method uh, of visualizing the content he was uh, he wanted to transmit or to communicate. And um, in this particular uh, detail, I show you a little bit in bigger scale. Um, it's one of the rare examples where Francesca also gives measurements, as you maybe can see, because it's like P45, which means in Italian, uh, piede. And so you have 45 feet. Obviously, it's uh, like a, a measurement unit, uh, which is antique, so or like Renaissance, so you can't translate it exactly. And you also see that he gives uh, indications about uh, the spaces like loggia or uh, courtyard or the, uh, the hall. And he does that like quite often, but uh, as I said, the me measurements are given only in these uh, two images we see here at the bottom of the page. And um, uh, in effect, he describes these plants much more in detail. So when we look at these plants, we see that he uh, only indicates the, the passages, the, that is doors normally, and uh, where there are walls, but uh, columns or like arches and the staircases. So it's really uh, very much simplified. And also one often cannot, um, exactly decide or like discern if it's the ground plan or the, the first floor. <clears throat> so to, uh, to go further uh, into the handbook of Francesco, one should say that he heavily uh, is based on uh, translation he did by himself, most probably by himself, which is like a huge effort at that time, as there was no Vitruvius translation or no Vitruvius edition uh, in, re in reality. So he, like, <laughs> he uh, struggles a lot with this uh, text and he comes to like really funny interpretations of the uh, ancient architecture. Uh, as you can see here, uh, he uh, deals with the theater and he mixes up actually what you 
under, you can understand it looking at the image, and that's what I find quite interesting. Uh, maybe you you don't understand it from the text, but then you see the image and you you understand. Okay, he's mixing up uh, the idea of the Greek theater uh, and the uh, amphitheatrum. So he puts inside the orchestra and all the elements he uh, he derives from the description of the theater uh, from Vitruvius, and he puts it in something that seems to be the Colosseum. And um, another detail, which is on the same page, uh, is actually something that uh, is highly discussed among um, music theorists and or acoustic uh, scientists and uh, about among archaeologists still today that if there is um, uh, um, a system of um, of uh, of um, <clears throat> vessels of acoustic vessels I'm sorry I <laughs> I had to search for the term of acoustic vessels that were meant to enhance and to, to um, bring the voices of the, uh, of, the, um, um, <clears throat> of the actors to all the ranks of the theater. So um, he tries to reconstruct what uh, is effective, what is uh, very hard to understand in the description of, uh, of Vitruvius. And what is interesting is how he represents these uh, vessels uh, as he employs uh, la, an, like um, a normal representation with a cut of views or section, sectional views of, uh, of part of the elements he shows. So he cuts off uh, the bottom and he, he lets us see inside. And that's something he does very often. So he combines um, he combines, as we see here too, he combines uh, maybe an elevation or an overall view of, of architecture structures uh, with um, sectional views. Uh, here again, we have uh, some uh, discussion he takes from Vitruvius, that is uh, about the ancient path. And he then he first describes it as Vitruvius described it, having really big trouble to understand it actually. And then he uh, uses this knowledge about ancient bath to propose um, modern bath for, uh, for, the, for the rich people, like for courtly people and so on. And so what we see in the detail is actually how he, combines um, frequently the, the drawing with um, some uh, legends, that is some maybe texts or phrases or also uh, single words or yeah, yeah, like explanations. He puts right inside the image to, um, to teach in the end, to teach the, the reader the terminology and to use the image to guide uh, to guide the viewer. So um, this one is like here. You see that he he calls it like uh, the the bath um, um, as as they were in ancient times or as the ancient built them. And then he puts inside these uh, single uh, descriptions and single explanations. And also here, he uses a transparent view because we can look inside this uh, room where this bathing room, which is oh, in this case uh, quite a bit um, difficult to understand because he reconstructs it um, erroneously, let's say. And uh, on the right side, he uses um, um, an elevation, but he cuts off, or like she show, he shows in sectional, a sectional view, uh, some of the elements which are most important, or like the most important elements of these rooms, he shows in, in a sectional view that is, um, 
the the heating which comes from from the pavement and which goes up the wall and so um, heats also the walls and so he shows the the wall in a sectional view to um, to make the the reader and the viewer uh, understand that there uh, that is the place where the heat goes. <clears throat> so this is um, one of the examples where he combines sections and uh, sectional uh, yeah sectional views with uh, normal elevations and also with um, trans transparency in the drawing. What uh, in the end, Francesca is most famous for are uh, his uh, technical drawings, which were at that time very famous among the architects, that is uh, in the 15th and 16th century, because um, since Brunelleschi uh, in the first half of the 15th century built his own machines and cranes and hoists and winches, to uh, to make, uh, for example, the, the cupola of the Florentine Dome, uh, making one's own mechanics or yeah cranes uh, became very famous and something that was uh, more than element to be proud of. And so these images of uh, of cranes, for example, are something that. Um, goes on from the 15th century to the 16th century, and which um, takes a really big part in the, in the treatise and in the handbook also of Francesco. And you see he combines like uh, machines to lift up columns or to lift up obelisks and to lift up, up heavy objects in general for um, building architecture. And, Again, here, this is uh, another example of how he um, <clears throat> he tries to to transmit knowledge about um, about mechanics, or in this case, about uh, um, about um, <clears throat> uh, instruments to to uh, use water to generate energy. And what is interesting about these uh, images is that when we take a closer look, we understand that he also tries to um, make understand the, the viewer or the reader in which directions the single elements of the mechanisms move. And what does he use to, uh, to illustrate the movement in an image? <laughs> he, you, in this case, he uses the water, but he also, um, Obviously, he needs to, to show in which direction the water flows. And so if you, if you look closely, you will see that there are like small lines which indicate the movement of the water or more easily uh, here when the wa water comes out, uh, we simply know that it goes down. So the, the, um, the wheel must move in one direction, <clears throat> one specific direction. So um, what I showed you before are the drawings of the first uh, treatise or of the first writing, which I called handbook. And uh, what you see here uh, is a page from the treatise, which is like 15 years later, or maybe 20. Um, and we see immediately that uh, everything like changed regarding the layout, regarding the presentation of the content, because uh, Francesco reduces all his drawings drastically <laughs> and he concentrates on single um, objects or single case studies, which are used then to, uh, to teach the reader about, uh, about a class or a group of, um, of mechanics or of machines in this case. Um, but uh, he continues to use the same images. He simply um, like simplifies them sometimes and um, always he uh, presents them in a much larger scale so that one can um, maybe more easily understand them. And here I come back uh, to showing you some um, 
plants or ground plants of, uh, of architecture. Just um, to make you understand um, or to illustrate the difference between the two, uh, the two treatises and the evolution that happens between them. Uh, because obviously the content is much more, more or less the same, but the presentation um, seems quite different, would be maybe exaggerated, but it's different. And uh, we, on, on the one hand, that is because the content changes slightly. He um, puts much more interest or um, emphasis on discussing uh, ground plans and dispositions of uh, civil architecture or civil buildings. But he also maybe prepared his drawings to be printed. So um, he like took away everything that was uh, pictorial in the, in, the, in the drawings of the handbook and he um, streamlines somehow uh, his drawings. But on the other hand, he uh, uses them more effectively to, uh, to communicate um, uh, messages about uh, the use of the single rooms and um, so he gives much more often like indications as how to uh, use these different spaces. And one last image is uh, one last image is to just show you which um, which kind of pictorial drawings let's call them uh, Francesco Di Giorgio um, did show um, or did uh, display in his. Um, in his treatise. And one last detail, um, one might think that it's uh, something that comes from being also an artist or painter, which Francesco Di Giorgio obviously wa was, because as we know, back then, <laughs> the architects were something like in between. And um, so one would expect the, the drawing to be something coherent in like central perspective or something like that. Uh, but actually he puts together single elements and he uses the shadowing not to, uh, to create a um, coherent space, but just to give a volume to the single elements. And what maybe is also interesting for who um, is not that familiar with um, Renaissance drawings and Renaissance uh, representation of architecture that he actually um, represents in these uh, few buildings, the uh, archetypical or the stereotypical image of Renaissance architecture. So um, uh, symmetrical facades, uh, buildings with lodges, and on the in the heart of the city, he uh, puts like, like a church with a central plan. So he ticks all the boxes of what uh, what we later will uh, regard as typical uh, Renaissance architecture. So um, I very much see uh, forward to the discussion and hope I could uh, give you an insight into my research. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sophie and Lida and Marshad and Celia. Thank you for the three really amazing presentations. Thank and you. I must say, I'm really uh, so excited of tonight's session because I knew so little of, of your research and, and your design project and I'm I'm really happy to, to have got an insight. I I think we, we should have made it maybe earlier, but it's uh, it's really good to to see what you're working on. And uh, like I have to start with with this impression that uh, Francesco Di Giorgio made on me because like <laughs> usually we're quite intimidated right by these kind of heavy important Renaissance architects mm -hmm. and uh, I'm really so relieved that they had this sense of humor <laughs> 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 and that they kind of uh, used to uh, you know like that these kind of misunderstandings used to happen right yeah. when when try, trying to figure out what the kind of earlier generations of architects were doing right and yeah. I think that's quite uh, quite 
inspiring actually also in the way we work with references usually so i think uh, uh i'm quite happy about the, like of, uh, kind of getting to know this aspect of uh, of renaissance architects yeah. um but um like right now we're supposed to do have a discussion among uh, the four of you that would be yeah the, our goal for tonight to, to just talk on, you know, like on, on topics that like where your interest might, might uh, kind of cross. Uh, mm. And then like towards the end, we will also open, open the um, a Q and A for, for everyone attending. Uh, but maybe just some kind of a bit of input to, to start the discussion. I must say like in all, like in all three presentations, I was so fascinated by by this inter interdependence right between image and space and how kind of ideas get transferred like from like right now I'm thinking of this um, of the of Le Corbusier's uh, painting uh, I, I can't remember the name with the sun right uh, and how he yeah I don't know rhythms of the sun and the sea exactly and how he transfers right a reality into a representation of something that then inspires a design project that turns into reality again but kind of converted so yeah. um uh yeah I'm, I'm not sure if this is a kind of a, a starting point for this kind of interdependence and transferring of images and kind of developing of images through the different media from text to image to space uh or kind of uh, narration of ideas through kind of exhibitions and experimenting through kind of uh, temporary spaces. Um, maybe, maybe I think, uh, I think, I think so, because uh, when I, I, I was really fascinated by these, um, the idea of uh, transferring this image uh, to uh, to into architecture or to to make architecture out of it, and I I thought that uh, I said, thought about uh, actually maybe it's it's also um, maybe you said it or maybe it's something completely obvious, but I felt like he saw movement in in this painting and he like picked up this movement of of. Um, on the sun and the moon, and or the, the sun and the sea. So, <laughs> sorry, and he simply did something that would maybe uh, replicate this movement, or would would like cause this movement. And so, I, I maybe that's also something that is really particular about uh, architecture and image and images of architecture, because you, in architecture, you have the movement. And I mean, it's like architecture defines movement and makes movement pos possible and when when someone that is uh, so used to to create and to shape movement looks on or uses images maybe it's also something that um yeah something that creates a different use of image if you if you think of space more like something you move through and not something you just have to depict on on, on the two-dimensional surface. So I, I think that it's it's really something that continues to to yeah to to uh, be the the red the red line maybe you you can say the, this movement through images, which then becomes architecture and then goes back to images. <laughs> Yeah, like, uh, so, uh, I mean, uh, yes, like, um, uh, actually, like, this was about the Kobuzia, like, in the beginning, three, four years ago, when we started, like, uh, actually, four years ago, when we started, like, studying, and going through this idea of how, um, how image has been used in architecture and looking through like Heyduk's project and also Le Corbusier's project. That was interesting for us because 
uh, with image, sometimes also you think about memory, you think about like it's as, as, as I said, and as we said, it's like a visual representation at the mm -hmm. end, because like our eyes is the first place uh, that an image, you know, can be created. So we just receive something by our eyes and it's, it immediately turned into an image. And then we maybe can have it in our memory. So, and for each one of us, that image can have different qualities. And that's why like for like Luke Rebusier, they are not rhythms of the sun and the sea. Uh, it was uh, interesting because he saw the sun and the sea. Actually, he's talking about also day and night, you know, mm -hmm. in opposition and then putting it, you know, in that way. That's why it has this bipolar characteristic that he later on brought it, you know, into his projects and used it in different ways. Uh, so, and then it became more interesting when we saw another use of this image and uh, the way how someone can also read the quality of that specific image in different way and even use it in different way. So it's not anymore like the human being in the beginning seeing a tree and turning it into a shelter and also imitating a trunk of tree to a column. Now it's more complex the way like uh, we can like grasp qualities from an image. Yeah. Because we are, as like we are working with different mediums, we are like kind of bombarded with different things that can kind of, that kind of can affect the way that we see things mm -hmm. too. So, and that changes uh, like these kind of aspects and attributes and characteristics of something for us. You know, all these things meant, meant like kind of mean different for us. Yeah. yeah. But I think you, you also touched on a kind of a, a quite nice point that I've I wrote down in like in from Celia's presentation that like images are are representation, but there's actually much more, right? Kind of in, in this potential of formation of kind of mental images and of kind of activating memory and also kind of activating experience. So mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's quite uh, quite fascinating. How much is embedded actually in a kind of a two D representation of something, and that's also quite exciting. How how you two are trying are kind of exploring the spatiality of kind of B dimensional paintings, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because like at some point you feel like the necessity of also like representation and when you're talking about image because uh, it's all about representation and, and like as I said, there are like now different mediums uh, for presenting something or representing something and the, all, all of these mediums, you know, affect the way that we understand something and actually in architecture we are dealing with representation a lot. So it's kind of a discourse also for itself in architectures. And that's why that brought the necessity of understanding these also representational tools and the way how they can affect um, the way which we kind of understand or like reflect to something. Um. Yeah, I'm not sure. So I'm, I, I'm supposed like my, my role now is to, to get you all engaged in the discussion. So um, I'm not sure if you would like to add something maybe on, on this, Celia, or um, um, because it's, it's, it's not about. So um, maybe I, I should go on with more aspects that have been fascinating me through throughout the, your presentation. Um, <laughs> so I'm not sure. Celia, you are muted. Maybe you unmute yourself. So um, great. So if um, yeah, it was also quite uh, quite interested in in your presentation in in this idea that we experience actually 
far more than we understand. And I'm sure that happens to us, like for sure in space, but also like when kind of contemplating images. Um, so I feel like there's there's so so much actually that kind of we unconsciously unconsciously absorb, kind of when being confronted, um, kind of with the ideas embedded in space mm -hmm. and uh, like in in a in a safe space maybe or also in kind of in front of images or in front of um, text and images. But I think that's quite, uh, that's quite a strong statement. And uh, I have to look up uh, Marshall McLuhan's <laughs> So it's good that we all, always collect also really nice references uh, kind of in these presentations. Um, but yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe uh, I just, um, I think it's it's really interesting about what what we see in an image and what because I think uh, normally we, we we think about images are like uh, uh, easily to understand or like easier to understand than text or words and that we don't have this translation problem we have when we use like. English. I mean, I speak English, and I'm not sure if I really say what what I think because English is not English is not my mother tongue. So uh, this translation confusion we we think we don't have it when we look at images, but uh, we do have. I mean, because when you look at images with the training of an architect, of an art historian, or of an archaeologist, we already have this baggage. And to decipher or decipher like aspects which um, would like say to us, okay, so this is a ground plan, or maybe it's like th something between a ground plan and a section or something like that. So we can like go through the image and we, we see the little points that indicate us like change of, of, of character, of of theme or of of the way to uh, to represent, but um, actually, that I th I think this is really the challenge architects all always had, and always will have that we that they do not communicate their knowledge only to other architects or or to artists, but to a really enormous a variety of, of people and that what I that's what I found really interesting in um, in the presentation of um, of Celia that uh, making exhibition is all about or is very much about um, making uh, ideas or like transmit and communicate ideas to to a public I, I maybe cannot even define clearly. So it has to be something that is uh, understandable, but not, not too easy. It's not to be cheap or to be like too oversimplified. And I think this is really the, or I, I myself uh, see it as, as the, the challenge that maybe brought me to study drawings because I, I, when you look at drawings or you look at images and you look closer and you understand always one, you always go one step further and then you look together with some somebody else and the somebody else sees com something completely different in the same image and uh, so how do you use the same image to transmit the same idea to a var variety of people so it's yeah <laughs> Yes, I think it is always uh, the, the challenge in our exhibitions, especially because we always try to to include all ages from uh, yes two years up to ninety nine years, and um, they should. Um, Yes, experience uh, 
uh, exhibition together, not the children, the, the grown up or the experts and the, the lion. So yes, that's very important for our, our work and always, uh, um, yes, and we, we have often uh, or uh, deal often with flachware. <laughs> Uh, it's just paper. Yes, just just paper or text, or, um, and uh, try to bring it in, in a context um, that makes it accessible, like an image. Spatial context. Yes, spatial context. Um, I'm wondering if we have also maybe questions or kind of observations from the public. So if someone would like to intervene, just it would be great if you would turn on your cameras and just ask or kind of uh, enter the discussion. Or also put the question in the chat and I will um, address them to our guests. But I think it's, it's a good moment to, to get people involved. Can I just add something? Hello. First of all, I just wanted to say I completely agree and love the way Dr. Wolf puts Celia's work. Um, so obviously I have a question for Celia first, but as a, as a general note, I think, in ter I don't know if this was planned, but the three talks really fit well together. Okay. And thank you, all three of you, all four. Yeah, and myself, the, the whole thing so interesting is that we learn with every single project we do, we learn something new. Mm -hmm. There's hardly any routine within in, in, in working this way because it's, it's always, uh, you know, the virtual kind of space we come up with is, is, is each and every time based on completely different aspects of... of uh, a certain storyline or, or uh, a certain longing. And, and um, one of the most important elements I think that we had to learn in the beginning of our work is that exhibitions never are objective. They don't <laughs> represent a, a, a reality or, or mere facts. They always take a certain position. They always take a certain view. And uh, we always fill the exhibition up uh, and and load it up with these views and 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 um, the funny thing is uh, that uh, suddenly this there is this notion again between this mental image that we have and uh, the image of uh, how this can be communicated to a broader public mm -hmm. and uh, that we constantly use these codes and again you know then. Uh, how can these codes be understood? And, and, and the question that often rises and, and, uh, with me is that uh, as architects, especially at, 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 at the universities, at our schools, we start to use, uh, we, we take the codes, sometimes uh, we develop new codes that hardly can be understood. They're not uh, within the common language of the people around us. And, and we come up with this incredible architectures, these incredible forms, these incredible shapes and, and, and things. But uh, I think they often make it very, very hard for the people to, to, to project themselves into this architecture because they can't be decoded anymore by people outside of the system of thinking as we have it in architecture. And I think this is where a lot of the emphasis also goes into uh, that um, we have to reconsider, you know, on the meta level, uh, you know, beyond just being um, uh, exhibition designers, that we have to rethink that we have to, to make the codes that we use within our architecture and within our uh, profession again, accessible to the people. 
I see Giacomo raising his hand, so I suppose he has either a question or an observation to to uh, to what you were saying, Eric. Uh, no, a question, but not just for Eric and Celia, but for all the panelists. First of all, I have to say, as an Italian, I'm really happy because it looks like the Renaissance is back, which is <laughs> super cool. Um, and I was thinking, like, I think all the projects, all, all the presentations, so for me at least, a kind of connection of what we sort of define now as autonomy or discipline somehow, mm -hmm. and also cultural notions. And in really, like, for of, of, obviously in the Renaissance, but and I was wondering about what you were saying, Eric and Celia. I, this summer, I visited the project in Hull, mm -hmm. and uh, I was. Um, curious to know how do, did people react to that because it's quite abstract no even though the meaning is uh, also quite explicit once you go there and on that note also to lead a merge I'm super curious to see the house built <laughs> because in a way I'm also really interested to see how your kind of geometric manipulations let me say say it like that analyzing uh, interact with let's say with uh, the life of the people living in it. So I think it's, uh, it was a super interesting uh, discussion. Unfortunately, I think there are no students anymore, but I think it was super interesting also for them trying to connect, to think how to connect these uh, notions. Let's say. Yes, Xavier said I should answer. Um, I should answer your question on, on, on uh, the place of remembrance. I prefer to call it rather a place of remembrance than a memorial kind of thing, um, but because this memorial makes it kind of big and we don't, didn't want it to be big. We wanted it to be modest and still uh, we wanted it to be kind of present in, in, in the fabric of the environment that uh, you see in, 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 in uh, the psychiatric, uh, psychiatric clinic in Halle. And uh, there's one thing that when you saw it wasn't ready at that point of time and that was nature because we had to open it in, in autumn and uh, we have now to wait till uh, the snow is gone and the nature is strong enough to, to basically take uh, up its part in the whole um, installation. But um, the funny thing was when, when the whole um, first the exhibition came up, suddenly the historians that worked uh, for the whole project got stormed by uh, the relatives and, 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 and people who knew uh, these um, victims of the Second World War and asked about you know, what happened to them and wanted to know more about their life and their history. And um, so the funny thing is despite those people kind of they never met them and, and think they th these people in the in the lives of of, of their relatives um, kind of left a hole of you know not knowing uh, wanting to 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 fill the gaps and things like that and that was the idea of what we wanted to represent in, in uh, with these kind of abstract elements which are you know as a shape you can say kind of a, a an abstraction of a stone with all you know these kind of voids little voids embossed into each and every element you know this void that was left behind and the funny thing is out of the um, reactions that we get from the people it is not about that uh, they understand in, in in terms of literally what we wanted but uh, the message somehow gets across and they find their own words of 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 uh, how these these elements kind of uh, uh, work inside of them and and how they they read them and this comes in in, in in most of the cases very close to what we intended and so there we have kind of an understanding that you know this seems to be uh, in, in, in in that terms successful and um, that it is, and, and what I still like about the project is exactly that, that um, it is not uh, trying to make the things big. It's not trying to, it's just, 
trying to, to say, you know, this is not uh, 360 people. One can say that this is a very small amount of people compared to what we know happened in Second World War. But it's even those 360 people that matter. And that came across, I think, fairly well. And there was a wonderful, when we had the opening, there was a wonderful speech uh, of a person with, with mental disability and how this person basically uh, uh, told this story about how she was confronted with, with, the, with this uh, installation. And it was so wonderful to, um, to hear a person um, just reflect on that, just out of the emotion. It was really a, a moment, in the, and you, you see it, you hear it now with my voice, but that really touched, I think, a lot of people around, and, and that's an image that then again will, will stay uh, with us for a very long time. I'm sorry, my computer died. I don't know why, just turned off. Yeah, I, I, but I, I didn't stop talking, if, <laughs> if you don't mind, because, you know, it was uh, kind of a touching moment. So I don't really know exactly when you dropped out. Uh, you were saying about the, the people in uh, kind of interpreting the work, but accepting it, if I... Yeah, not only accepting it, but also uh, finding their own definitions for them, for the... For, 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 for the for the installations and the things. And um, those weren't so different to, to, to the thoughts we had uh, in the first place. And then, you know, there was this one, as I said in the end, there was this one speech of, of um, a woman with mental disabilities that, that uh, started to explain how she uh was confronted with the site and the storylines and and that was so touching and 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 uh being able to to represent our ideas with so so, so simple but but um strong words uh made us think uh, okay our intention kind of worked <laughs> besides being touched by ourselves I don't know. That no, I, I would like to go there tomorrow <laughs> to, to, see, to see your work. Yeah, I mean, um, maybe um, I just uh, jump in because I think in, in, it's really uh, maybe also what um, when we say we don't, um, we maybe do not have the same definition of image. Uh, everyone, but um, then again, maybe it's exactly the point of using images that we um, want to have this room of ambiguity or like of, of something that needs to be interpreted or to be filled with the life and the ideas and the background and all these um, uh, emotions that other people bring into, into these images when they look at them. Because I mean, otherwise, I could write like 10 pages describing a space or describing an, ar an architecture and like to try to explain it really in detail. Um, but when I use an image, I, on, on the one hand, I use that something that is much more similar to the mental image. Uh, and, and then happens what, uh, what Eric also described. I mean, the mental image, it, it, it becomes a physical image. And then I, I, I have to acknowledge that the physical image will never be like my mental image. And maybe I also discovered that my mental image does not work that way, or I like have the occasion to improve it. But then again, this, uh, like we have the first image, the mental one, then we have the physical image I produce. And then there's the third image that becomes the mental image in the hand of somebody, somebody who, looks at this image. And then again, it becomes something different. And um, actually, I think it's this incredible power of an image to, to convey an idea and to, to, like, to make it live on because it changes constantly, but somehow, and we cannot explain why, somehow the, the 
the heart or the core, it remains. And th this is, there are always some elements that will remain the same or that will stay and, and it changes. And so it, it's something that lives on and it is always also creative. And this element of creativity, I think is also something that for the architect is like um, the essence of using images because it's not only saying how something is or how something can be, but also realizing if, some, if something works and if something is convincing or attractive or like beautiful. And um, so, yeah, I, I just, maybe it, that's why I, um, I always come back to images because it's not so defined and it has this element of life, yeah. So it's, it's just, I find it really interesting to have this discussion about all the different pr perspectives on image and obviously uh, having also a, like a more theoretical background, the idea of defining what an image is. Uh, I mean, one would have ne the need of discussing like hours and hours and reading and theoretical preparation, but somehow when you put that apart, you, you also can talk about images without having all this, uh, like, mm, like how, how do you call it? Iconic turn, knowledge, and so on. We don't think of. Yes. Because picking up of, of, of Eric and, and Sophie less comments, it's somehow we as designer, let's say, try to curate this kind of, of images, although we don't want to compact it as you really well describe it, Sophie. But then mm -hmm. I'm I'm curious when the when the image gets out of control, uh, or there are no curated no no no, no curated images. And we, we see that uh, now every day with the constant exposure that we have uh, uh, different media, et cetera, et cetera, different sources, uh, where the content of an image doesn't matter anymore. But it is, I, I rather question if there could be a, an overall image or a non-curator of images, or who is the authorial, who is the author of this non-curator and final image that that comes out of the constant different exposure that we have from different sources, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know if, if you if you can have any any thoughts on, on that, on these big non-curational uh, images that in the end we are nowadays exposed in the in the everyday. Yeah, I don't know, maybe I'm the least uh expert one on this, <laughs> but I think it's a really interesting idea to, to say that an image can be um, without an author, but because in the more traditional understanding of image, uh, let's set aside the definitions, um, I think there cannot be an image that has no, no author. But obviously, um, then again, um, we have this uh, century long discussion about um, an author, a text without an author, and so maybe also images without an author. And I think the, the idea maybe is that, um, that at the beginning, obviously someone took the image or created the image or shaped the image. So there has been kind of an author which had maybe also an intention or maybe he just like took photographs or, or doodled or how do you call it? And, um, but then it becomes uh, every layer, every user of the image, like um, changes it a little bit. And then uh, it becomes something different. And, and so in the end, when hundreds of thousands of people have used this image, somehow it becomes something that has no uh, specific author because because it has like one million authors, and so maybe maybe that's what um, 
but also makes uh, the media so interesting. I mean, social media sharing images and copying images and taking images from and from someone without uh, like citing or like uh, referencing to to the original author. Uh, but uh, then again, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't. I actually don't think that uh, having no author means having no meaning. So, and that's, uh, or not being constructed or not being, um, yeah, like uh, being something that has been made. So it's made, but it's not, not anymore has one author, but it's, it has uh, so many authors, yeah. And but I think it's really fascinating the idea of images that travel so fast and so so far. Um, my question is, is 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 kind of going back to 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 understand the thing. You know, I'm absolutely aware of 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 that we have now tools and processes where we 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 lose the authorship mm -hmm. and. And uh, things coming to existence where, um, you know, that we couldn't have imagined, I'd say, that words that are sometimes so complex in, 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 in themselves that uh, the human imagination in the first place is not enough uh, to, uh, to generate things like that in the first place. And we use these tools and uh, are often baffled and, and astonished by the results that we see. But what I wonder is, are we capable of not interpreting them? <laughs> like leaving them as what they are? Or are we doomed to, to interpret them, especially when we look at them as architects? Because as architects, I still think, uh, uh, we have to utilize the elements in somehow. And uh, we have to ask ourselves, so what could they be? Do they have scale? Do they have material? Do they have space? How does that work? And, and things like that. And those questions, I can't help it, but I auto, automatically these questions can all come up in my head. Yeah. And uh, being a person that, that got taught by, you know, uh, people like Ben van Berkel, Zaha, um, and, and, and others. It is always been, you know, that point uh, where at, I somehow have the feeling that I have to ask those people, sorry guys, I don't buy it. This is where, um, you know, the reduction of, 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 of these processes into, um, into, you know, incredible forms and shapes that we can't even, uh, in, in terms of, of what comes out of it, we can't even have, you know, we're not smart enough to give them proper names. And, to, to, and, and uh, I think uh, that's something that's part of our human nature is that we want to give the things that are around us kind of names to to be able then again to to um, to to somehow put them in into different again layers and and and, and perspectives so that that they become uh, that they matter and that they uh, start to become uh, you know important in 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 terms of 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 people's lives and um, here and either whether they are then what what comes out is is is, is strong enough to be uh, the basis of a discussion or because the shape somehow reminds us off and 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 then uh, we call something the building suddenly a pregnant oyster or uh, things like that because we, we we always look for the images that how how can we we deal with the things and and the most important element for me in, in, in that sense is, however the architecture and, 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 and the spaces are produced, at some point I'm uh, obliged as an architect to project myself into the space. Mm 
into the architecture, into the space, and start to see how uh, does that space reflect me and myself and the person, uh, and, and I'm, am I capable of mirroring myself into that space? And uh, when that starts to be really, really difficult, um, then I have to start, for me and my project at least, uh, start to reconsider, you know, how and, 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 and uh, could that be read, understood, and things like that. Because I still believe, you know, uh, in, 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 in the no I know that it's very unpopular for the moment, but I still really believe in the notion of a certain narrative and the semiotics and, and uh, the ideas that Umberto Eco put into <laughs> our world uh, 50 years ago, basically. And um, yeah, but um, I think that we have to at some point, we for the moment we use the tools. We we we're, we're capable of producing incredible things, incredible stuff. And on the other side, especially uh, uh, what Studio Two tries to do is uh, try to understand. Uh, we will never be the ones who, who who will be at the cutting edge of producing these things, but we are always uh, in the way of to discussing these in context with, you know, other basic elements of architecture as, you know, the human being, the social life, the environment, the contextualization and whatsoever. That was a long sentence, I know. <laughs> oh, it's great. I mean, uh, I, I'm quite fascinated by the idea of maybe, you know, it would be quite cool if we could acquire this capacity of right unlearning or like untraining what we've trained as architects and kind of yeah. be able to come to a state where we could like look at images like in a more genuine way in a more maybe innocent way in this professional sense I think that would be quite a quite a nice um, goal to, to kind of aim for in order to always be kind of open to have a fresh look on everything, right? Um, yeah, but anyhow, I think we, we came to a point where it would be like super nice to just kind of transfer the discussion we're having into a more informal one, like kind of having a beer and to keep discussing. But unfortunately with Zoom, it's so frustrating because you just kind of uh, ended the meeting and that was it. And then you're, you know, <laughs> Uh, but I think, I mean, I think we had really su such nice input tonight and such nice, um, yeah, ideas coming together. And I hope this will encourage like all of us and uh, also the students who are not uh, <laughs> kind of following anymore because they're probably having dinner. Um, kind of, we would be really happy. And this is uh, like the main goal that, uh, we as kind of curators, Gonzalo and myself and the whole IARC have with these meet your uni sessions is that we keep discussing, right? Where we, when we meet on a corridor or just beside Gonzalo or, I mean, I think it's a, it's a good kind of kickoff to, to continue discussing in, at our faculty in general. So thank you so much uh, to our guests for, for the, for the presentations and for the nice discussion and thank you all of you for attending and uh this semester we have one more session on the 5th of may so stay tuned uh we'll be sending uh emails and uh you can also find info on the iarc facebook page and uh yeah it was so nice to to, to see you all and uh, talk to you and see you and hope to see you soon and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>